Well, one of the things to know about uh, the SIAC family is that uh, we've been involved in real estate for about three generations now. And it kind of all started with uh, our grandparents, uh, who, who my grandfather was a banker, and then he got into, uh, started a real estate company in San Diego in the late 60s. And so our family's always kind of been around buildings, land, homes, all that kind of stuff. It was a great summer job growing up, in, especially in high school. My brothers and I would go down to San Diego just to work on properties and whatnot. I'd go work in the morning, go to the beach in the afternoon. It was, it was pretty sweet. But one thing about a, a building is that you've ha you got to have a solid foundation. If you, don't, if you don't take the time for the site prep and the, and the pouring of the foundation, you're in trouble with your building. And nothing causes more concern to a, an owner than when the something's wrong with the foundation of a building. Right? You've got to build that solid. You've got to build it right. And of course, uh, buildings are built for a purpose. Right? There's a difference between a gas station and an apartment building. Buildings are built for some sort of purpose. A building built for education, we call that a school. A building built for healing, we call it a hospital. A building built for manufacturing, we call it a factory. A building built to be lived in, we call that a home. Now, St. Peter says in his first reading, I'm sorry, his first letter, that was our second reading, you Christians are living stones. Therefore, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. What kind of building is he talking about? What's a spiritual house? Well, if we turn to St. Paul and we look in the first letter of the Corinthians or we look in the, his letter to the Ephesians, we find a, a specific designation of what this spiritual house is. He says, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. A temple. That's a very unique kind of building. A temple is distinguished from all other spiritual houses, even from like a synagogue, right? A synagogue was, was a place for gathering, for learning. But what is the temple? The temple is the place where God dwells. The temple is a place where he abides with his people. And so if you want to know, if, is God with us, especially in the Old, in the, in the old Covenant, you would, you would look and you see the temple and say, yep, there he is. Which is why the exile from the, in the Babylonian exile was so devastating, right, in that, in, that, in that first covenant. But the old temple was a foreshadowing of the Lord's ultimate plan. That is, his church made of living stones, people, souls, each of whom would be a temple of the Holy Spirit. First, Jesus' own body, and then those who would become members of that body, which is, which is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So we hear St. Peter tell us, be built into a spiritual house. And St. Paul tells us, to be you, that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So if you're a baptized Christian in the state of grace, guess what? You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. God dwells and abides in you. Which is why a moral sin is terrible, because that expel, expels that presence from our souls, but fortunately, with a good confession, the Lord restores that. It makes us, once again, temples of the Holy Spirit. Now, God's temple is not, not just a normal building, but it's the mystical body of Christ. So you and I are supposed to be living stones as part of this spiritual house. That we are to be living tabernacles of the Eucharist. That's what the, the Lord thinks of us that he delights to dwell in us, in you and in me. So whatever, wherever we go, whatever we do, we are to bring God's abiding presence 
to that place and that time. You and I are to be a sign that God has not abandoned his people. And hopefully that people can say, is God with us? They can turn to a Christian and say, yep, there he is. So what's key to being built into this spiritual house to be bearers of his abiding presence in the world, we need to be in that deep, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the solid foundation upon which the spiritual house is built. Jesus just told us, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if we follow him, if we cling to him, if we suffer with him, if we abide with him, if we rise with him, he fashions us into his temple. And so this is our mission of our, as Christians, this is the mission of our parish, to be built up together as living stones, to become that spiritual house where Jesus dwells and abides, and the joy and the peace and fulfillment that come from that, and then to take his abiding presence in the world, which needs him so desperately. That's our mission. And one of the primary ways we do this as a parish is in our families. And as a pastor, I love helping dads and moms to raise their children in the faith. That's the best thing you can do for your children is not simply to let them get a good paying job, but to know who they are as made in the image and likeness of God, to know and to love Jesus Christ, who is the way to eternal life, and to find their vocation in Christ. And so with this in mind, what I'd like to do is to share with you, the, the parishioners here, some very exciting news about our school, our parish school. You know, our pa pastoral vision provides a great vision and direction in this, of putting our, our parish school at the heart of what we do. Our primary work of evangelization is our parish school to bring everyone who is involved in that school into that saving, transformative relationship with Jesus Christ. And what's going on in our school shows our pastoral vision at work and has inspired this, ne this next step in our parish school for the renewal of Catholic education. And not just here at Christ the King, but actually throughout the archdiocese. So what has happened? Well, Archbishop Sample has asked us to be the first and hope, ho of hopefully many Catholic schools in the archdiocese to renew Catholic education through what's called Catholic liberal education. And the reason why he chose us is because we've been working in this direction for the last four years, actually. And this next step is just kind of formalizing the direction we've been going for these last years. So what is Catholic liberal education. Sometimes we hear that word liberal and we're kind of like, what? But liberal, we have to, we have to understand what liberal means, right? From the Latin word, root liber, free, to be free. Not just in that narrow, I would say, kind of uh, almost a misapplication sense to some sort of you know, leftist Marxism, socialism sort of thing. That's not tr what true liberal is. But, but uh, Catholic liberal education is about the liberal arts. And what is important about the liberal arts? Well, they're free be because they're not geared for just producing a specific thing, like maybe, say, engineering or some of the hard sciences and things like that. Rather, what liberal art, the arts have to do is with the meaning, the value, and the purpose of things. The meaning, the value, and the purpose of things. And it, 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 is, it is, has been brought into, uh, into our Catholic education from er, very early on. And the, this is kind of the founding principle of Catholic education is that all knowledge is taught in relation to the source of all truth, who is God himself. 
And so because God is at the center and the, and the, and the uh, foundation of this enterprise is that it provides a coherent and uh, a compelling vision of reality. So with God at the center that everything is coherent, right? The relationship between math and science, between science and religion, between history and literature, and all of the subjects can find their source and coherence in the, those liberal arts. Now that's to be, um, so, so in other words, it's not just simply training in facts and information, but rather it's a coherent, comprehensive, and I would say compelling vision of reality, of life, of what it means to be human, and how to find the blessed life. And so what, what, um, what we want to contrast this is basically what's happened to education across the board, and even in Catholic education of the last, I would say, probably 50 years, is that what has happened is that we have abandoned what made Catholic education great and instead imported a secular philosophy of education that actually puts the human person at the center of all knowledge. But what happens when we do that is that we, all knowledge begins to break apart into fragment into these bits of information and facts, right? We lose the coherent vision of reality. And so, um, and so then we begin to lose what it means to be human. We lose what is the story, what is the meaning, the purpose, and the value of things. And we don't know our, where, we, where to find ourselves in it. And so we have this, um, this uh, uh, in a way, it's kind of like a Trojan horse. Right? We can bring that secular philosophy into our Catholic education. We can put a veneer of Catholic faith around it, like we can do mass and things like that and prayer. But the essence of what the education is about is something secular and will begin to fragment the education. Let me, let me put it very starkly for a lot of people here. You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you know someone who's been through 12 years of Catholic school and doesn't even believe in God anymore? Right? I, I don't know how many conversations I've had with, with Catholic parents over the years of like, we wanted to raise our children Catholic and we do these things and after all this education, they just walk away. Now there's many reasons for that, but I would propose to you that a foundational reason is the philosophy in which we educate. And that if we import this Trojan horse of a secular philosophy, we're not going to achieve or get the fruit that we are, we are hoping for. Um, and so, what, and this is a difficulty today, right? We have graduates from even universities who are smart, who are, who've crushed their exams, who are very intelligent. They have, they're ready to have great jobs. They have these great skills but they don't know who they are. They don't know the meaning of life and to find their place in it. They don't know the, the story of salvation, right? And what's the result of that is we have so much greater amount of anxiety and depression among our young people. Right? And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? But one of them is that we don't, we haven't given them the, the coherent, comprehensive vision of reality. And so you feel lost. I think, um, uh, you know, for those, of, for those of you who are in the greatest generation, and for those of you who are in the baby boomer generation, if you went to Catholic school, you got a lot of the, of the Catholic liberal education. But beginning with my generation of Generation X and onward, is slowly and gradually that got replaced by the secular philosophy. And so we have Catholic schools who say they're Catholic and do these things, but are not producing the fruit that we would hope, let's just say. Um, and the problem, too, is that if we don't have, if we're not steeped in the liberal arts, we become very susceptible to ideology. What is an ideology? It, an ideology usually takes a couple good things out of reality 
gives them a certain spin, usually finds a scapegoat of some sort, whether that's a class of people or a race of people or whatever, and, and uh, d says that that's the vision of reality, this sort of struggle. Whether it's Marxist ideology or a fascist ideology or a materialist consumerism ideology, whatever it might be. That if we know the meaning, the value, the purpose of things, then we know how to assess those ideas, how to pull out what is good and to reject what is bad. And if you think about it, I mean, we're, we're right on the verge of a, of a great, uh, important struggle with AI, right? This massively power techn of technology, right? Which has the potential of being, bringing a, an immense amount of good and also some very destructive possibilities as well. How will we know how to do that if we don't know the meaning, the purpose, and the value of, of things? Right? It's not enough just to be able to invent it. We have to be able to know how to use it for the good and how to mitigate what is, what, what, what bad uh, possibilities about it. So that's kind of the vision. Um, and so what has happened so far? Well, I guess let me make one last point about that. I guess to summarize it is that, and this is what um, our principal Sarah Tabor often says, is that in Catholic liberal education, we want to make engineers and scientists and all these people that have this great impact on the world, but not to, not to educate just an engineer, an engineer who is a saint, who knows what it means to be human, who knows Jesus Christ, and is able then to be that engineer. So what has happened so far? Well, here's, here's the, I just want to bring everybody up to speed on, the, on what's happened. So the Arch, this, this renewal of Catholic education has been on the Archbishop's heart from the very beginning. And uh, so he's wanted to, to look for a pathway for this sort of renewal. And uh, the, the, the thing is, is like, well, there's this great vision here, but what's the path? What's concrete? Well, how, can, how, does, how does this get done? Well, there's a, an organization called the Institute for Catholic Liberal Education. They are a group of very high-powered, uh, very passionate educators who specialize in the renewal of schools in this way, especially Catholic schools. They're, they're in over 100 schools across the country. And, um, and so we've been looking at things. And so the archbishop asked Sarah and I to come in and talk to him and his leadership team. And when we got done talking to his leadership team, unanimously they said, here it is. This is the path. This, we think this is going to work. And we'd like you guys to do it. And so what that means for us is that he has made, given us kind of a special designation, is that we are now the Archbishop's Pilot School. The first of hopefully many in the Archdiocese. We're the first school in Oregon to affiliate with the Institute for Catholic Liberal Education. And so we are going to, re our school re will report directly to the Archbishop with the Department of Catholic Schools in a support role for, for, for us. And then after that, we went to our teachers and we laid it all out there for them and it was a beautiful time together. I don't know how many teachers, after hearing all this, and because we've been moving in this direction for a long time, many of the teachers came forward like, finally I understand why I was so frustrated as a Catholic teacher. And now I feel like I can really be that Catholic teacher that, I, that, I've, always, that I've felt called to. And so, uh, so the teachers are, are now on board with that. Then the archbishop asked us to talk to the school pastors of the archdiocese. And so a little over a week ago, Sarah and I went down to the pastoral center. We met with 20 school pastors throughout the Portland area and actually all the way down into southern Oregon and laid it out for them and got a very positive response for that because there's a lot of school pastors that are very frustrated with the lack a fruit that is coming forth from our Catholic schools. And, and so they're looking for, for new ways to, to, to capitalize on this. And, uh, uh, and so there's now other pastors that are now looking into this and wanting to move it forward. So to let you know is that this is what the Archbishop has asked us to do. And we have now officially affiliated with the Institute. And I am very excited, very excited. Our teachers are very excited. 
There's a lot of families that are very excited about the possibilities here. And to know that the Archbishop gives us his full and unequivocal support for this, that we're his pilot school. And we look forward to, to how, how that moves forward. So, uh, uh, so I just, to offer you a warm invitation to, to come along with this. That, uh, you know, I, uh, when I was talking to the, my brother priests, I, I was sharing with them just from my own heart is like how much work a school is, how much time, energy, stress, and, and you know, they all nodded in agreement. And I said, you know, when I realized that what we were doing is not producing the results, I was like, I can't give that time and energy into something that is not going to give us the results. Right? We can't keep doing the same losing strategy and think we're going to have a different outcome. Right? We have to change the strategy. And, and that, I think that's gave these pastors a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, energy and excitement about, about what we're doing. So to, to invite you all to be a part of this. Right? The, the school is our major work as a parish after divine worship. And to, to join Sarah and I and the Archbishop and our teachers, uh, to, to, to do this. And we need your prayers, we need your support. Right? We have our jogathon coming up, we need your financial assistance too. And, and to, uh, to build something with Jesus here, to, uh, to build a solid spiritual edifice in our own hearts and in the hearts of our families and our parish and our children through this Catholic liberal education. That's a solid foundation. That the way, that in that way, through an intimate relationship with Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, our children and families can be built into that spiritual house, the temple of the Holy Spirit, to become holy and to transform the world. Amen.